Before we do that, though, I believe we have some announcements here that I need to go through uh, with you here before we uh, start the sermon. And again, we're doing it this way for the benefit of those who are uh, tracking with us here um, on the live stream. So the first thing is, uh, today we are resuming our children's church ministry. We made known last Sunday what the kind of, you know, what the agreed upon sort of uh, parameters were going to be for that. Uh, I announced that. I have that in written form here later if, if anyone would want to see that. This was uh, come up with the, uh, by the consensus of the teachers. Um, Saturday, October 17 at 11 o'clock, that is the next major event uh, here at the church. We will be having the memorial service um, for Joan Blaine, and we'll be doing that here at the church at 11 o'clock. Um, a couple things I just want to say about that. Um, the family is asking, because we have people, the family has people coming in from all different states, that before and after the service, that people would mer- that, w- that they would please wear a mask in the building. You can take your mask off once the service has started. And um, this is kind of a request uh, by some of the members of the family that they, they, they would like for us to do that. So I'm making that known. It would be nice if somebody next Sunday would also kind of remind everybody of that. I'm not going to be here next Sunday. We're going to be um, on our anniversary trip, Becky and I. And my dad is going to be here next Sunday, and he will be preaching. There will be no adult Sunday school at 9 o'clock, but we will have, obviously, still the main service. And my dad, Steve Ross, is going to be doing that. So after October 17, the next thing on the 24th of October is our Bible conference. On Saturday, that's all on Zoom. There are orange sheets out here with the schedule. And on the church's website, there is a link uh, in the upper right-hand corner to the conference page, and then if you click on, there's a button there to click on and open the schedule where all the links are uh, to the different Zoom meetings. So that's October 24 and 25. You give me the next one, please. And then this is just a couple reminders. We've got board meetings scheduled for November 7, and then we have one for December 5. So that'll take us through the rest of the year 2020 as far as board meetings go. And then uh, Blake and Amy have obviously created the uh, resources there for the teens um, for their use on social media. And then your offering options, just a reminder here on this, are the um, box over there by Kurt, right over his shoulder. And then we have uh, PayPal as well as snail mail if you uh, wish to do that. And just a reminder once again, yet again, about the one anothering fund that has been established to help people that might have an issue, okay, uh, with uh, finances related to COVID-19. So I'm just going to go ahead and make sure I share this uh, video on Facebook to the church's page. And once that's done, I'm going to be off and running here with the sermon. So looks like we're good there. So if you would turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to continue our series of studies here in the book of Colossians. And we left off last Sunday with verse 3. So what I want to do is we'll read verses 1 through 3, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this morning's study. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Lord, thanks for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have this morning to come out and study your word and to sing praises unto you. Lord, we are grateful this morning for the resumption of our children's ministry. Uh, we pray for uh, those who are back there now that things will go as, as, as well and as smoothly as possible. Lord, we also know that there are, there are some families in the church that have been affected by um, COVID-19, be it through their school system or through their uh, whatever, that there have been some people that have been asked to quarantine themselves because of potential exposure. Um, uh, I'm aware of a couple situations when it comes to that. We pray for them and uh, we pray for their safety, uh, that they will be back with us as soon as possible. Um, We pray that we'll just make smart and wise decisions as we're out and about and going about our daily lives. And we just pray this morning that we'll be edified from the study of your word. We're grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead as the only total complete payment for our sin. And we're grateful that we're saved by grace through faith. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So last Sunday we started in verse 1 and we came all the way down for, through verse 3. Are we good on the sound? 
All right, great. We came all the way down through verse 3, so I want to pick this up here this morning with verse 4. Look with me at verse 4. It says, And this I say, <clears throat> lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So we're starting at verse 4. It's a little bit of an awkward place to start, which is why I read before the prayer there verses 1 through 3. So in the context, when, he, when Paul says there in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, the thing that he's saying when he says there at verse 4, and this I say, is what he just said in verses 1 through 3. Okay, well, what did he just say in verses 1 through 3? He talked to them about the riches of the full assurance of understanding. He talked to them about the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So in the context, Paul is talking about what he just said in verses 1 through 3, about the mystery of God, about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge being hidden in Christ. Okay. So the question then is, why does Paul want the Colossians to know those things? And he says in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should do what? Beguile you with enticing words. So Paul is worried that the Colossians are in danger of being beguiled. Okay. So the reason he said, verses 1, 2, and 3, about the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ and about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge being hidden in Christ is because he's worried, he's concerned here, he doesn't want them to be beguiled. He doesn't want them to be tricked. He doesn't want them to be fooled through the use of enticing words. So we need to understand the idea of beguile just here briefly a little bit. The English verb beguile carries the following meanings according to Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language. It means to delude, to delude to deceive, to impose on by artifice. Now, if you're, not, if you're like me, I'm like, well, that didn't help me because now I need to look at what artifice means. So artifice means trick or fraud. So let's put that together. To delude, to deceive, to impose by artifice, trick or fraud, or craft. So to beguile is to trick, to fraud, to be crafty, to be deceptive, okay, to try to move somebody away from something using some sort of trickeration or subterfuge or something along those lines, right? Hold your hand there and come with me all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Come with me all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. We encounter the serpent here. Notice what the Bible says about him. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 and look with me at verse 3. Genesis chapter 3. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, and uh, well, verse 1, Now the serpent was more what? Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, <clears throat> Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Satan here is described in verse 1 as being very what? Very subtle. If something is subtle, what does it mean? Is it like coming at you full-blown, full blast with sirens blaring and wailing, telling you trouble, danger, danger, or is it sneaky? It's sneaky. Come with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Come with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So Paul is worried. He says... This I say, lest any man should beguile you. Paul is worried about the Colossians being beguiled. He is worried about them being fooled. He's worried about them being tricked through fraud or false information. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 19. It says here, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own what? Craftiness. So, Satan and his minions are very crafty. They are very wily. They are involved in trying to deceive you. So when we look at the definition of the word beguile, and it says to delude, to deceive, to impose by artifice, trick or fraud or craft, when it talks about craft, it's not talking about you know knitting or doing something crafty in that sense. It's talking about something that's crafty in the sense of being sneaky, being
being, you know, done in an underhanded way. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 4. So this is what Paul is worried about. Paul is worried about them being beguiled. He's worried about them being deceived. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, now watch, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of who? By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to do what? Deceive. See, the thing about sin, the thing that makes sin particularly insidious is that it's crafty, right? You might even enjoy it for a while. It might even be something that you get enjoyment out of for a while. But before you know it, do you find yourself ensnared in it and that it has a hold on you? Okay? So he's worried, Paul is worried, about them being beguiled. He's worried about them being deceived. He's worried about some trick or fraud being played upon them that is going to move them away from the truth. Come with me back to Colossians chapter 1. Come back to, Col- I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2. <coughs> so if, you, if we think about verse 4, so the reason he said, verses 1 through 3, it is told to you in verse 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you. Now, notice the language there. He says, lest any man should beguile you. What that tells you is this. Even people who know the truth, even people who understand the issue of justification by faith, even people who understand the issue of the Word of God rightly divided and dispensational Bible study and the unique message and ministry of the Apostle Paul, are they still capable of being beguiled? Yes, we are still capable of being beguiled. And in fact, I might argue that we are sort of at the top of Satan's beguiling list, right? Other folks that don't understand these things, they've already been beguiled, right? They're already in the snare of the devil in the sense of their understanding of things. So he's not really too worried about them because he's already got them, but is he worried about people who, uh, who understand the mystery, who understand the word rightly divided, who understand salvation clearly, who understand that they're not saved by their works, who understand the issue of the Bible, etc., right? He wants to beguile us. Verse 4, and this I say, lest any man, he doesn't want it to happen. He doesn't want them to be beguiled, lest any man should beguile you with what? Why? See, notice that beguilement is related to enticing words. All right? Words that sound good. Words that sound pleasing. Words that sound correct. Words that sound right. But they're not. And so there's that enticing words. Paul does not want them to be beguiled i.e. tricked or deceived by enticing words. The Greek word rendered enticing words here occurs only one time, this time, in the Greek text supporting the King James Bible. But according to Strong's Concordance, it can have either a positive or a negative meaning. So I want to share this with you, and I want you to think about this. All right. One idea of enticing words is the following. Speech adapted to persuade. So if I am going to entice you to buy a car or entice you to do this or to do that, the the framework of my speech is going to be speech that's persuasive, right? I'm trying to convince you to do something. That's the first concept here. Speech adapted to persuade. Discourse in which probable arguments are are adduced. In other words, you're setting forth arguments with the idea of trying to persuade somebody. Okay? Now, I can do that for one of two objectives, right? I can if if I'm trying to convince you that salvation is by grace through faith through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, am I going to set forth words in such and, and, and set forth arguments and words in such a way so as to try to persuade you to the truth of that conclusion that the only way a man is saved today is by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. So can I use my language and my speech in that way? Yeah. But if 
Paul's worried here about them being beguiled through enticing words. He does not envision the use of persuasive language here as a positive thing. He is seeing it as a what? As a negative thing, right? So that brings us then to the second idea here, which is, in a bad sense, persuasiveness of speech, um, specious discourse leading others into error. Okay, so that's sort of the negative way that you can use enticing words, right? I mean, if I'm trying to explain to you about justification by grace through faith, I'm trying to persuade you to the truth of that position, right? But you can also use enticing words in a negative way, in a bad sense, which is designed to lead somebody into error, lead somebody into falsehood, lead somebody into something that is not true, all right? Meanwhile, no, Webster defines the word enticing, um, as inciting to evil. Inciting to evil. Okay? Urging to sin by motives, flattery, or persuasion that is alluring. So when Paul's talking here about enticing words, them being beguiled by enticing words, he's not talking about the positive side of persuading somebody to the truth. He's talking about somebody using good-sounding, flowery words that sound good to the ear, but are ultimately designed to lead them into what? Error and untruth, not the truth. Having the qualities that entice or allure. So what Satan is a master of doing is taking sin, taking false doctrine, taking things that are ultimately bad for you spiritually, and what he is a master of doing is packaging them in a very alluring and enticing packaging so that you don't realize that as you give mental assent to that idea, to that doctrine, to that whatever it is, to that behavior or thought pattern or whatever it is, he's, but as you, so he's, he's trying to allure you into that where you don't realize that you are embracing something that is not beneficial to you spiritually, right? And so here's Paul saying to them, look guys, I told you in verse 2 about being comforted, about being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I told you all about that here now in verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should do what? Beguile you with enticing what? Now you don't have to turn there, but in first in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, what does Paul call Satan? He calls him an angel of what? Light. And he says, is it any wonder then if his workers also be transformed into the ministers of what? Of righteousness. So Satan is the ultimate beguiler. He is the ultimate tricky, tricky, crafty person, right? Individual that is trying to get us into a situation where we are beguiled and we are moved away from the truth. So what are enticing words? Enticing words are words that are intended to persuade us in a bad sense in that they are designed to lead somebody into doctrinal error. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. <clears throat> Paul's talking here now about his preaching <clears throat> in Corinth. Verse 4, he says, "...in my speech and my preaching..." was not with what? Enticing words of man's wisdom. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now, I don't know what you think. I, I'm sure, I'm sure that I would, if I would have ever gotten to hear Paul preach, that I would have thought he was an excellent preacher. So what does he mean here when he says, not with enticing words of man's wisdom? Paul is not concerned with sounding good to the way men judge goodness. That's not what he's concerned about. He's concerned about giving them what? 
the truth. Not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and a power. Why? Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of who? Of God. See, here's the problem. If your faith stands in the wisdom of men, then you are only secure in your faith. You are only stable in your faith until you hear something else that sounds what? Better come along. And when you hear something else that sounds better come along, you will then run after that, you will try to embrace that, and you will forget about where you're supposed to be standing. Okay? Go back to Colossians chapter 2. So he's not doing it with... Paul didn't use enticing words of man's wisdom when he preached the gospel. Paul did not, you know, water it down. He didn't try to make it palatable. He didn't, you know... He didn't, you know, sidestep the issues of sin and so forth to try to, you know, appeal to the ear and not offend people. Paul talked plainly. He talked straightly. He talked straight up to people about the issue of judgment to come, about their sin, and about the wrath of God being upon their sin if they die in that state. And he also talks to them very plainly about the only remedy for that situation through the cross work of Christ. So he's not interested in trying to you know, use enticing words to fool people, to trick people, to beguile people. Go back to verse chapter 2, verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now, here's what I personally think. Go back to verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, as for, and for as many as has not seen my face, where? So we talked about that two weeks ago. That's the emotional conflict that Paul had for them. He'd never met them. He'd never preached to them. He'd never ministered to them. He'd never been to Colossae, right? Okay? So the conflict that he has in verse 1 is related to verse 4, his concern that they not be what? Beguiled. That they not be moved away. That they not be beguiled by enticing words. Paul's emotional conflict for them in verse 1 is related to them not being enticed away from the truth in verse 4. Now, how do I know that, or why do I say that to you? Because we've seen Paul say similar things. Come back to Acts chapter 20. Come back to Acts chapter 20. Put simply, does Paul want the Colossians to remain in the truth? Yes. He does not want them to be beguiled. He does not want them to be moved away, etc. Acts chapter 20. This is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders here. Verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So that's what the eldership in the local church is supposed to be doing. Verse 29. For I know this, now he, so he knows this, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples unto them. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with what? Now think about this. Paul has been in Ephesus for three years, teaching, establishing the church, preparing the eldership for the day when he would have to what? Leave, right? Does he know that when he leaves, grievous wolves are going to enter in from outside and men from within are going to arise speaking what? Perverse things. And he says, remember that I warned you about this day and night with tears for how many years? three years, right? So there's the emotional aspect of the ministry and what Paul knows is going to happen, right? Now imagine, come back with me back to chapter, Colossians chapter 2, imagine how he feels about saints in an assembly that he's never what? He's never seen. Now, I'm speaking here in purely human terms, but I'll ask you a question. Who do you think had a greater advantage? The Ephesians. I'll say it this way. Who do you think had the greater truth advantage? The Ephesians, who had Paul literally 
in their presence, ministering among them for three years, or the Colossians who had never seen his face in the flesh? I would say the Ephesians have the greater truth advantage, if you will, right? And does Paul say, when he calls the Ephesian elders together there in Acts 20, even after the three years that he knows what's going to happen when he leaves? So the concern that he has in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1 for them, the great conflict that he has for them, the emotional conflict that he has for them is, in, is, 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 is expressed in part in verse 4 when he says, and this I say lest any man should beguile you with what? This is what he's worried about. Verse 5. And notice how he hits on this immediately following verse 4. For though I be absent, how? Or where? In the flesh. So this is clearly to me Paul's point here. Right? He's worried about him being beguiled and enticed. And a lot of it is related to the fact that he's not there, that he's never been there, and he's worried about them going to hear these flowery words, these enticing words, and then on account of that, being moved away from the truth. Verse, verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So, as I just mentioned, contextually this first statement, the first phrase of verse 5, for though I be absent in the flesh, contextually this statement takes you back to verse 1. Again, Paul's warning about enticing words in verse 4 is related to the fact that that he was absent from them and had not been with them in the flesh. Now look at the next part of verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, so Paul has never been there, he's never seen him, he's never been to Colossae, but notice what he says. Yet am I with you in the what? The Spirit. So even, Paul, even though Paul was not physically with them in the flesh, he says that he's with them in the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about that statement. I'm going to be honest with you about something here. Have you ever been having a conversation with another believer, and they say something like, well, we're there with you in spirit, brother. You ever heard somebody say something like that, Right? I'll be honest with you, I've had a tendency when people have said stuff like that to me in the past to be like, yeah, whatever. Okay, yeah, you're here with me in spirit, mm-hmm, whatever, right? I, I hope I'm not the only one that's, am I the only one that's thought that? Eh, maybe I am, maybe I'm confessing too many sins, I don't know, okay? But what struck me when I read this verse, when I was uh, preparing for this, is Paul said that exact thing. And did he literally believe what he said? So that means then that as believers, it is possible for us to truly be with other believers in spirit, even though we are not physically in their what? In their presence. So I have to admit to you that this is a little bit of an attitude adjustment for me. If somebody says that to you and they really mean it, is it true? If, and they're a believer, and they're a justified member of the church, the body of Christ, is it true that they can be with you in spirit even though they are not with you physically? That's what it means, right? Okay? So that means then, I'll say it this way also, I have friends in the ministry that if I'm lucky, I see them once a year if I'm lucky. Sometimes it's two, three years in between times that I see them, right? And I kind of mentioned this maybe last week or the week before, I don't remember, but when I finally get to see them, it's almost as if no time has what? Passed, right? And you think about that and you're like, well, how can that be? Because I have people that I see every day that when I see them again, like for example, some I have some colleagues or whatever that I, I, I work with, etc., and I have I'm cordial and have good relationships with them or whatever. But I go all summer and I don't see them, and then we come back together, and it's a little bit like you got to get that through that sort of reacclimation process, right? 
So my point is, Paul is saying here in verse 5, For though I be absent of the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. There are people that I have met through, you know, uh, uh, through email or through social media or for other things that I've never met personally that are supportive of our ministry, that are supportive of, of me uh, being the pastor of this church, of our family, my wife and I, etc. And I've never met them personally. I've never seen their face in the flesh. But are they with us in spirit? According to this, yes. So this isn't something that I should laugh at. This isn't something that I should be like, oh yeah, right about. There's an attitude adjustment here that I've had from these verses about this. Paul was with them. So how was he with them then? How can you, let's talk about it then. How can you be with somebody in spirit even though you are not with them physically? Well, if you're saved and they're saved, are we all members of the body of Christ? Are we all members in particular of the body of Christ? Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, does Paul say we're one member you know, where, member, where one member rejoiceth, all the members should rejoice, and where one is... So there's that, there's that spiritual element and dynamic in the body of Christ that's in play in this conversation, right? So, but there's also Paul... I think Paul was with them in his thoughts and in his prayers. Okay, come with me back to chapter 1. Come with me back to chapter 1 of Colossians and start, let's look at, start at verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3. We give thanks to God <clears throat> and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the next phrase? Praying always for you. So prayer is going to be, prayer is going to be involved in this being with them in what? In spirit. Verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. So again, he's only heard about it. He's never what? Seen it. He's never been there to see it himself. Verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, As ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So, how did Paul know about these saints? He knew about these saints because Epaphras what? told Paul about these saints, right? Verse 9, For this cause we also, here it is, since the day we heard it, did not cease to what? To pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul was with them in spirit in that. Paul held them in his thoughts and did he lift them up in his prayers. So it is possible then, believers can be with other believers in spirit, even though they are physically parted from each other, and maybe you never had that thought, but I did, but this is a real thing. And Paul is speaking about it here under inspiration as it is a real what? Thing. Verse 5, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit. Okay, so he's with him in the Spirit. When he's with him in the Spirit, what does it mean? Now let me tell you what that doesn't mean. Oh, I should probably say what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that Paul's engaging in some like hocus-pocus hoodly do Like he's some sort of dead-parted Jedi and appearing to them in an apparition. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi or something. Okay, that's not what he means. Half you don't even know what I'm talking about. When, I, when I'm talking about... Star Wars and over. Anyway, he's not appearing to them in some sort of ghostly form, or appear, Paul's not appearing to them in some sort of dream, or anything silly like that, right? That's not what it means when he says he's with them in spirit, right? He says, verse, uh, in spirit, joying. So Paul's having an attitude of joy toward them, 
joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. They are together in spirit around some very specific particular things. The first one is the joy that they have in the truth. The second one is the order that they have as an assembly. And the third thing is the steadfastness of their faith in Christ. So he's not with them in spirit like, you know, worldwide coalition of Cub fans or something who are all mourning after getting swept out of the playoffs. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about them being in spirit around, being together in spirit around the specific, some very specific truths in a specific way through prayer and thinking about them. He's considered himself there with them in spirit. Verse 6. Well, look at the end of verse 5. Beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now look at verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk ye in Him. So Paul is going to begin now to encourage them related to their walk. Related to their walk in Christ or the manner and, and, and their walk in Christ is to be in the same manner in which they what? Receive Christ. Look at what the verse says. Uh, verse 6, For as ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? So if we can understand how they receive Christ Jesus the Lord, what is Paul telling them to do in that verse? He's telling them to walk in the same what? The same manner. I messed up the mic. This little thing came off the end of it, so I'm not going to mess with putting it back on. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. How did they receive Christ Jesus the Lord? How did, how, how did the Colossians receive Christ Jesus? They received Him by grace through what? Faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should what? See, if, if somebody's giving you a gift, you are receiving the what? The gift, right? The gift of salvation is received by grace through what? Through faith. It's not works. It's not performance. It's not your ability to do what's right. It's not any of that stuff. It is a gift that is received by grace through faith, right? So think about what he's saying. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in who? In him, right? That's what Colossians 2 6 is saying. So they are to walk in a manner and in a way that is consistent with how they received who? Christ Jesus the Lord, right? So we as believers are to walk in grace by what? By faith. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As members of the church, the body of Christ, I want you to look at verse 6. He says in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from who? The Lord. Now look at this little parenthesis here. For we walk how? By faith. Not by what? Not by sight. Did Israel, did the Jews require a sign? So are they looking for God to demonstrate through signs His favor or lack thereof upon them? We know that. We've studied that many times in the past, right? But we are not Israel living in time past. We are the body of Christ living in the, dis by the way, the dispensation of what? Grace, how are you saved? You're saved by grace through what? 
faith, how are we to walk and progress through life as believers? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in who? In Him. So our walk, our conduct, our progression through this life is to be on the basis of grace through faith. It's to be in accordance and in the manner with the way we received who? Received Christ. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, religion gets that all wrong, I need to point out. Religion comes along and says, no, you need to work. You need to do. You need to perform to have God's favor or to retain God's favor or whatever, right? But that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Your walk in Christ should be in line with how you received who? With how you receive Christ. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk how? Worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace. How should you walk? With loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing who? One another. That's how we should walk. We should walk with the same heart attitude as the Lord Jesus Christ. We should walk that way. We should think that way. We should behave that way. We should function that way in relation to all, in relation to every creature under heaven. Even the people that you don't like. Even the people that you disagree with. That doesn't mean you have to embrace their beliefs. It doesn't mean you have to say it's true. That's not what he's talking about. But is there a is there a way in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves that Paul tells us to function as a member of the body of Christ? But you know, a lot of what I see going on right now is people like they take this book and they like load up their doctrine gun like it's a bazooka and they point it at people and Try to blow them away. There's not a lot of in meekness instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. Go to Ephesians 5. Here it is. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk how? In love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given Himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling what? See, we're supposed to walk in love. To those that are within, those who are members of the body of Christ, and those who are what? Without. What does Paul say in Galatians chapter 5? He says, You've been brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love do what? Serve one another. That applies to all people, regardless of sex, regardless of skin color, regardless of any of those things that divide men in the earth. You're to walk in love. You've been given liberty in Christ. Under grace, you've been given liberty in Christ, not so you could hoard your grace, so to speak, into your own little like grace cupboard, where you just, oh, look at all this grace I have, and you never take that grace, and you never demonstrate that grace, or manifest that grace, or treat other people in grace, right? As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk ye in Him. This deals with how you treat people. This deals with how you think about people. This deals with how you approach people, how you interact with people. Because you're, you've been given liberty, not for, the, not for the, the purpose of serving your flesh, but to take the grace and the liberty that we've been given and to use it and to buy love. Serve who? Someone else. That's what Paul's talking about. Come over back to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here, and I don't know if everyone's going to like it or not, but I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. We, who do you interact with when you leave this building? 
Okay? Who is, who do you, how, where in your life are you making it a point to interact with lost people? I'm not saying accept their lifestyle. I'm not saying embrace their philosophies. I'm not saying agree with them about, you know, I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, where when you leave this building are you making it a point throughout your week to interact with lost people? Do those lost people need to get saved? Okay? So, I mean, are we, are we taking ambassadorship seriously or are we going home to the places where we're comfortable, sealing ourselves off and sitting there and passing judgment on everybody and everybody else for everything? Or are we taking the, this truth and are we going out into the world to make a difference in the world with the truth of God's Word rightly divided? Now, I, I can't answer that. Now, I know for me, my job takes me directly into that arena every day. And I interact with people that are, that, that are lost, that need Christ, that need the Gospel, and as opportunity presents itself, I share those things, right? But I'm saying to you personally, to eva- I'm challenging you to evaluate your own life and think, when are you making it a point to interact with people who are lost? People who are different than you. People who think different than you. Because if we're, if, if we're not... Look, go back to the verse. Verse 6. Uh, uh, Colossians 2.6 As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? Walk ye in Him. Now let me ask you a question. Did Paul walk around the first century and say, oh, you see that person there? I can't talk to them. Or that person over there, you know, they're involved in that, and I don't think I can talk to them because they're involved in that. He didn't do that. When he writes to the Colossians, when he writes to the Corinthians and he's talking to them, and he, he, he says, um, he, he talks to them and, and their, the relationships that they were having, their former relationships that they had been having, men with men, etc., and women with women, and so forth. He says, such were some of you. So did Paul look at what they were involved in and say, ah, you know, they're just, they're just too far out there. I'm not going to talk to them. Is that what he did? No. See, we think, even still... We as believers, we still think too much in terms of what we're comfortable with and what we're not comfortable with. So I'm, I'm not, not in terms of those people over there are lost, and if they die lost, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire separated from God. Even people in our families, people in our circles, we need to not be afraid to talk to folks about the truth of God's Word. Verse 6, As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Verse 7, Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So in the time we have left, I just want to mention a few things there about verse 7. He says, Rooted, he finishes verse 6 and he says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So that's in Christ, right? Rooted and built up in who? Him. Who's that? That's Christ. Okay? Rooted and built up in him is the first characteristic of our walk in this passage. If something is rooted, it has roots planted or fixed in the earth. If it's rooted. Therefore, it is rendered firm, fixed, established, and thoroughly grounded. It's rooted. You ever try to, you know, remove a stump? Nothing worse in the world. No, maybe there's worse things. It's, it's, that's top of the list, though. There's always that tap root, right? That main root that, like, just go straight to the down and holds that stinking thing in the ground, right? So until you've worked that thing around or you get a big enough machine, it's probably better to have a machine. I've never had the luxury of a machine, so I'm out there trying to 
get this dumb thing out of the ground, right? It takes me an hour. Ken's laughing over here. It takes me an hour to get that dumb thing out of the ground. You know, I, how many saw the picture of me earlier this year going to Ace Hardware with a mask carrying a hatchet? Hilarious picture. I never thought in my life I'd go into a store wearing a mask carrying a hatchet and that this would be like the most normal thing on the face of the earth, right? Normally you go into a store wearing a mask carrying a hatchet, they think you're like an axe murderer or something, okay? Calling the police on you and stuff, but not, not in 2020, but I'm, I'm getting off topic here. Rooted and built up in him. You are, you're rooted, you have system, you have root systems that go in and hold you what? Firm. You're rooted. You're grounded. So when the winds of doctrine start blowing, you're what? You're firm. You're founded. You're established. Like the verse says. Right? This is the first characteristic of our walk. Therefore, it means to the idea of rendered firm, fixed, established, grounded, right? Go to Ephesians 3. Go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How? By faith that ye being rooted and grounded in what? In love. You know, this is why, this is why a lot of people don't like to fly. You know, to get in an airplane and fly. Because they don't feel what? They don't feel grounded. Go over to, go over to Acts 27. Go, go, go get Acts 27. Now, there's one endeavor that being grounded... It's kind of like bad. Okay? There's one endeavor that you might engage in as a human where you know you don't really want to be grounded because it would be a bad deal. Be a really bad deal. Acts 27, verse 41. Notice Acts 27, verse 41. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship what? A ground. That's a bad deal. If you're in the ship and you run it aground, you don't want to be grounded in that case, do you? Because you're probably engaged in some sort of dangerous situation. And ran the ship aground in the four part, notice, stuck fast. Stuck fast and remained what? Now notice all these words here that are associated with this, right? It ran aground. And when it ran ground, it, when it ran aground, it stuck what? Fast. And then it says, when it stuck fast, it remained what? Unmovable. But the hinder part was what? Broken, right? So what does it mean to be rooted and grounded? What it means to be rooted and grounded is to be stuck fast and be what? Unmovable. Okay? Go to Psalm chapter 1. The first sermon I preached when we came back for our, from coronavirus, um, from our coronacation, was on this passage right here. Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Notice what it says about this guy whose delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates in it day and night. Notice what it says, verse 3. He shall be like a tree, what? Planted by rivers of waters that bringeth forth fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall what? See, we need to be rooted and grounded in Him. We need to understand who Christ is. We need to understand who we are in Christ. Go back to Colossians chapter 2. I'm almost done. Sort of. I can cut it short. Verse 7, and rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. 
We need to be rooted and built up in Christ. Why? Because verse 3 said that in Christ are hid all the treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. The more, so think about that and put that together in your mind. The more we know Christ, the stronger and more stable we become. Because we understand that Christ is faithful. Rooted, verse 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. Notice how being rooted and built up in Christ leads to a faith that is settled, firm, and fixed. Established. So when the winds of doctrine blow, we aren't tossed to and fro with every what? With every wind of doctrine. Why? Because we're rooted, we're grounded, and the result is that we're established in the what? In the faith. And then he says, as you have been what? Taught. Had they been taught these things? Not by Paul. Because Paul's never what? Been there. They've been taught these things by Epaphras. They've been taught these things by other people. So that is important also observation because it tells you that any man who understands the truth is he capable of teaching it and preaching it so that others can also be established in the truth. So here we are in the 21st century, nearly 2,000 years removed from Paul, and through God's Word, do we have the ability to be rooted and built up and established in the faith? Okay? And then he ends, verse 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, abounding therein with what? With thanksgiving. How many of you remember back in the year 2013 when I did a whole six-part series on the issue of a heart of thanksgiving? I see one hand up. That's perfect. I'm glad all of you remember so well the thing. Oh, two. Okay. Three. All right. I, I'm glad everyone remembers so well all the things that I've... And I'm just kidding. But back in 2013, I preached a series of sermons titled The Heart of Thanksgiving in which we discussed in detail how absolutely essential thanksgiving is to your Christian life and walk. Okay? We can't... If we can't be anything else in this life... If we can't be rich, if we can't be wealthy, if we can't have health, because we understand that we're, are we all subject to the curse of this world? Right? So if we're here long enough, will all that stuff come for us? So if we can't have all that stuff, if we have to be shut in our houses, if we have to wear masks, if whatever it is that we have to do, can we still abound in thanksgiving because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us? Now see, there's where the enticing words come in. Because the enticing words come in and they are designed to make you fundamentally dissatisfied with what you have and to take away your gratitude so that you don't abound with thanksgiving. And is that not exactly the way that Satan attacked Eve in Genesis 3? When Satan attacks Eve in Genesis 3, his first things are, Yea, hath God won. Satan's entire attack against Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 is fundamentally designed to get them believe, to get them to believe that God was holding out on them. That God wasn't really good. And that God was fundamentally holding out on them so that they would immediately enter into a state where they were unthankful and ungrateful. And as soon as they enter into a state of being unthankful and ungrateful, he had them. You following that? I got all kind of verses here that we're just going to let go for the time being. But he says there, rooted and built up and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with what? 
We always have, we're going to go to one verse, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We always have something to be thankful for as believers. This morning in Sunday school, we learned about John Rogers. John Rogers was a man, the man who's responsible for the Matthews Bible. Uh, the uh, 1537 Bible. He fled England because it was not safe for him to be in England, and he goes to uh, uh, Belgium and Germany for a time, etc. And then. Uh, eventually he, he, he deems it safe and he comes back to England and he gets arrested in 1553 for preaching. For preaching which was viewed as seditious. And in 1555, Bloody Mary burns him at the stake. And she gets his wife and his 11 kids and brings them out and makes them watch as the Inquisition burns him at the stake. Do you understand that even if that happens, you can still be thankful? Because if somebody takes you, ties you to a pole, and burns you alive, you're going to heaven, brother. Sister, that's where you're going. Why? Because we have faith in who? Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything, in everything, give what? Thanks. It doesn't say for everything, give thanks. It says what? In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of who? Of God. In Christ Jesus concerning who? Folks, what's God's will for you? What's God's will for me? What's God's will for us? God's will for us is that we give what? Thanks in everything, in all things. So we come now to Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with what? With thanksgiving. See, that's that's what Paul wants. And enticing enticing words are designed to move you away from those things. To destabilize you. To get you listening to the winds of doctrine. You know, maybe, maybe if you just pick up one foot and the right wind of doctrine comes along, you can be ensnared. You following that? Lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. I won't be here next Sunday. We'll be on our trip. Um, so uh, my dad is going to be preaching when we come back in two weeks we'll continue with the next verse which is about philosophy and vain deceit after the beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after the rudiments of the world and not after who Christ you see how you see how Christ is the focal point of all this Lord, thanks for this day and for this time we could spend together in your word. We're grateful for it. We pray, Lord, that we will, we will take heart and strength and courage and comfort in Christ and gratitude and thanksgiving. This world is throwing stuff at us, it seems, at a record clip. But one thing that hasn't changed is that you love us, that you died for our sins, that you've forgiven us, that your Holy Spirit indwells and seals us, and that we have your word. Pray that we will be able to shut out the noise, turn off the enticing words, quench the fiery darts of the wicked thereby, be able to be rooted and built up in you, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. We ask this in Christ.